Washington and Oregon are home to many large cities, from the large metro regions of Seattle and Portland to the smaller but still prominent cities of Spokane and Eugene, there's no shortage of major cities in the Pacific Northwest. But all of these cities are located away from the Pacific coastline, leaving a large stretch without any major cities to call its own. So why are there no major cities along Washington and Oregon's coastline? And at the heart of this, of course, is the region's unique physical geography. The coastline of Oregon and Washington is defined by its dramatic physical geography, a landscape quite unlike any other part of the United States, and one that's very different from the long sandy beaches that most associate with ocean states. Stretching from the northern reaches of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington to the picturesque, winding shores of the Oregon coast in the south, this narrow strip of land is stunning geographically, but also very challenging. At its northern end, the Olympic Peninsula is a wild, untamed region. Here, the Olympic Mountains rise dramatically, their western slopes drenched by some of the highest annual rainfall in North America, beating temperate rainforests that stretch nearly to the ocean's edge. In fact, some parts of the Olympic Peninsula such as the Ho Rainforest, get as much as 12 feet of rain every single year. By comparison, just 75 miles east, the wet and rainy city of Seattle gets just 40 inches of rain per year, and the coastline itself is primarily rocky headlands, secluded coves, and long driftwood strewn beaches, shaped by relentless ocean waves and the uplift of tectonic forces. Southward into Washington's Gray Harbor and Willapa Bay, the Washington coast softens into broader estuaries and sandy spits, a testament to powerful rivers such as the Chehalis and the Willapa that drain the interior and meet the sea. Continuing south into Oregon, the scenic Oregon coast truly lives up to its name. This stretch from the Columbia River to the California border is renowned for its iconic sea stacks, towering rock formations carved by millennia of erosion, and dramatic cliffs. Here, the coastline is in constant, dynamic interaction with the Pacific Ocean, revealing tide pools teeming with life at low tide and offering breathtaking vistas from countless viewpoints along the famous Highway 101. The Samuel Boardman Scenic Corridor in the far southern reaches of Oregon's coastline is particularly renowned for its stunning beauty, so much so that it's often in serious consideration to become Oregon's second national park. Surrounding this long and pristine coastal strip are the Pacific Coastal Ranges, of which the Olympic Mountains are a part. This series of relatively low but rugged mountains runs parallel to the Pacific Ocean through both Oregon and Washington. While not as high as the Cascade Mountains further inland, the coastal range acts as a very large wall, effectively isolating the immediate coast from the inland areas of the Pacific Northwest. Its steep, heavily forested slopes and often difficult terrain makes the entire area very challenging to traverse, but they also help protect the interior valleys from the deluge of precipitation. You see, the climate of the Pacific Northwest coast is a defining characteristic of the entire Pacific Northwest. Often described as a modified oceanic climate, it's overwhelmingly cool, wet, and notably windy, especially during the autumn and winter months. The proximity to the vast Pacific Ocean, combined with the orographic lift caused by the coastal range, ensures abundant precipitation for the entire coastal region. But because of the coastal range, Places such as the Willamette Valley are relatively dry and much more livable. This abundant rain also impacts the overall comfortability of the region. While temperatures are moderate, rarely reaching extremes in either direction, the persistent cloud cover, frequent rain, and pervasive dampness create a landscape that is lush but can feel perpetually gray. Strong prevailing westerly winds frequently sweep across the open ocean, buffering the coastline and adding to the sense of isolation and exposure. This combination of rugged topography and challenging climate profoundly influenced the patterns of human habitation and development in this region. You know, talking about the Pacific Northwest, we've explored how its tough geography has kept it relatively free from urban sprawl. It's a place where privacy, in a way, has been preserved by its geography. But what about your personal privacy in today's digital world? Think about it. Just like how early settlers tried to connect the coasts of Oregon and Washington, data brokers are also trying to connect all of your data together and expose it. They collect your name, address, phone numbers, and even details about your family and where you work. 
They then sell this data to advertisers, telemarketers, and even sometimes scammers. It's not just annoying, it's a genuine threat to your online safety and security. That's where Delete Me comes in. They're a personal information removal service that scrubs your data from these data broker websites. And they do all of the hard work for you, identifying where your information is exposed and then getting it removed. They then continuously monitor these same websites to ensure that your data stays off it permanently, giving you back control over your digital footprint. Right now, as part of this sponsorship, you can get 20% off Delete Me's consumer plan. When you go to joindeleteme.com slash geobyjeff and use promo code geobyjeff at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com slash geobyjeff. Long before European ships sailed through the region, exploring its many inlets and bays, this rugged region of North America was home to thriving indigenous communities. For thousands of years, numerous indigenous peoples inhabited this coastal strip. Tribes such as the Chinook, Clatsop, Tillamook, Connaught, Macaw, and many more flourished here. Now, perhaps the most interesting bit of history regarding the coastal tribes prior to European settlement was that these tribes were, and still are, the only people to directly feel the 9.0 Cascadia Megathrust earthquake. In 1700, the Juan de Fuca plate slipped violently underneath the North American plate, creating one of the most powerful earthquakes the world has ever felt. The earthquake released so much energy that it created a tsunami that was felt as far away as Japan. And we know through oral history from these tribes that the earthquake and tsunami was violently destructive towards them. In fact, estimates from anthropologists suggest that anywhere from 30% to as high as 95% of indigenous people who lived directly on the coast were killed, which is perhaps one reason why so few Native Americans were found on the coast when Europeans arrived decades later. They simply didn't exist in the same amount as they did previously. Speaking of which, European contact with these tribes began in the late 1700s, primarily driven by the search for the Northwest Passage and the lucrative fur trade. Spanish, British, and American explorers charted the coast, with figures like Captain James Cook and George Vancouver making significant contributions to mapping the region. Unfortunately for the tribes, they would, once again, be decimated by something beyond their control disease brought by the Europeans. This added disruption marked the beginning of profound changes to their traditional way of life and to the region at large. A pivotal moment in the American narrative of exploration was the Lewis and Clark expedition. Reaching the Pacific Ocean in November 1805, they established Fort Clatsop near the mouth of the Columbia River, spending the winter of 1805 to 1806 there. And while their stay was relatively brief, it symbolized and authorized American claims to the territory, something the British, Spanish, and even Russians were angling for as well. The expedition also provided invaluable documentation to the landscape, its resources, and its indigenous inhabitants. Most importantly, their journals painted a vivid picture of the challenging climate and terrain, insights that would heavily influence future perceptions of the region's suitability for extensive settlement. Mostly noting that the Columbia River mouth at the time, seemed like a great place for a settlement. Following the explorers, traders and missionaries arrived, leading to the gradual establishment of the first modern settlements. These early ventures, however, often struggled against the formidable geographic and climatic realities of the region. Unlike the sheltered, deep water harbors of the Puget Sound or the fertile agricultural lands of the Willamette Valley further inland, the immediate Pacific coast offered few natural advantages for large-scale urban development. Coastal settlements like Astoria, founded in 1811 by John Jacob Astor's Pacific Fur Company near the mouth of the Columbia River, were strategically important for trade, but faced immense logistical difficulties. While Astoria eventually grew into a significant port, its development was inherently tied to its access to the interior via the Columbia River which proved to be one of the most challenging river mouths in the world. So much so that it has garnered the nickname of the Graveyard of the Pacific. Other early attempts at coastal communities were often small, isolated outposts, primarily focused on logging, fishing, or minor trading. 
Coos Bay in Oregon, and Aberdeen in Washington, both of which would develop into small coastal cities, would be founded in order to build up trade along the Pacific Northwest coast, but would ultimately be hampered by the lack of desire for people to move to where the actual ocean was located. Which brings us to the final question. Even after over a hundred years of consistent development, why are there no major cities along the Pacific Northwest coast? The striking absence of major cities along the Pacific Ocean coastline of Oregon and Washington, a stark contrast to California which has multiple major cities along its coastline, is not an accident, but a consequence of a confluence of formidable geographic, climatic, and economic factors, all told, from the Olympic Peninsula in the north and all the way through to the California border, this region is home to just about 600,000 people, which is far fewer people than either the Portland or Seattle metropolitan areas. So what's going on? Why does San Francisco exist, but there's nothing equivalent in the north? Well, perhaps the most significant impediment to large-scale coastal settlement was the formidable coastal range. This mountain barrier, running parallel to the ocean, created an immediate and persistent challenge to accessibility. The range is steep, often heavily forested slopes, made overland travel exceptionally difficult and expensive for early settlers, effectively isolating the coast from the more promising interior regions. Building infrastructure like roads and railways across this rugged terrain was a monumental undertaking, severely limiting the ability to transport goods to and from the coast, which is a prerequisite for significant urban growth. For a city to thrive, it needs robust connections to its hinterland for resources and markets, and the coastal range largely denied the Pacific Northwest coast this essential link. And when settlers did build paths and roads, well, they would wash out basically every season. Which leads us to the region's notoriously harsh climate. The Pacific Northwest coast is characterized by relentless coolness, pervasive wetness, and strong, almost incessant winds, particularly through the long autumn and winter months. This environment, while fostering lush temperate rainforests, was exceptionally challenging for early European settlers who had sought to establish agricultural or permanent communities. And this has maintained through the decades. The constant dampness, limited sunshine, and exposure to oceanic storms continue to make farming difficult, construction arduous, and simply living there an often uncomfortable experience. Early attempts at sustained settlement were frequently hampered, if not outright defeated, by these unforgiving climatic conditions. Many fledgling outposts were small, isolated, and struggled for mere survival, laying the groundwork for a perception of the coast as inhospitable for grand urban design. Even today, few people are able to weather the weather for an entire year. This is reflected in the many, many early European settlements along this particular stretch of coast that failed in terms of achieving significant scale or lasting prosperity beyond very specialized industries like logging or fishing. While indigenous communities thrive for millennia by living with the land, the European model of large-scale development and resource extraction found the direct coastal environment less amenable to other nearby areas, in part because of the lack of natural, deep water, easily accessible harbors that could accommodate large sailing ships. This, coupled with the dangers of oceanic navigation near a rocky, storm-battered shore further disincentivized major maritime commerce from anchoring here. But ultimately, the most decisive factor in the coast's lack of major cities was simply the magnetic pull of superior alternatives just a short distance inland. In Washington, the sheltered, deep-water harbors of the Puget Sound, with natural protection from oceanic storms and easy access to vast timber resources, offered ideal locations for port cities. Seattle, Tacoma, and Everett flourished here, becoming major hubs of trade, industry, and population. Similarly, in Oregon, the extraordinarily fertile Willamette Valley, protected both by the coastal range and the Cascade Mountains, presented an unparalleled agricultural potential. This valley became the agricultural heartland, fostering cities like Portland and Eugene, both of which benefited from its strategic location on the Columbia and Willamette Rivers, providing a navigable waterway to the Pacific without requiring direct coastal exposure. Today, the combination of the coastal range as a barrier, the harsh climate, 
the struggles of the early coastal settlements, and crucially, the undeniable advantages offered by the Puget Sound and the Willamette Valley create a huge detriment to people moving to either state's Pacific coast. And with just 600,000 people, this entire area would comprise just 5% of both states' entire populations. Which is crazy because people tend to prefer living on the coast, just not the coast of the Pacific Northwest. The coastline of Washington and Oregon is truly one of the most beautiful places in the entire country. But I'd be lying if I said that the onslaught of rain and wind wasn't a deterrent for most people, even for someone like me who loves the rain. Hey, speaking of Oregon, this week, I'm showing off the side that almost nobody realizes is actually the dominant Oregon. It's dry, dusty, desert half. If you're interested in seeing what most of Oregon actually looks like, well, come join me over on my other channel. I hope you enjoyed learning all about the Pacific Northwest Coast. If you did, be sure to check out this video all about why Australia has no major city along its northern coast. Thanks for watching. See you next time.